Hi, I'm Natalie Brunel, and thanks so much for checking out the Coin Stories podcast video page. I am talking to the legends in Bitcoin about their backstories, career paths, and why they believe in BTC. This podcast does not provide financial advice. This episode is brought to you by the Bitcoin Conference 2022. It's going to be held in Miami next year, April 6th through 9th, and it is going to be a four-day amazing festival with two general admission days, an industry day, and SoundFest. Tens of thousands of people will make their way to Miami, and I wanted to share some photos from the 2021 conference because that event is one of the reasons Coin Stories took off, and I was able to secure such amazing interviews with legends like Michael Saylor. Now, you want to get your ticket pretty soon because hotels are booking up fast. I know I recently just booked, so head to b.tc slash conference to get your pass and use Coin Stories as the code for 10% off. This episode is also brought to you by OKCoin, one of my favorite new places to buy Bitcoin. OKCoin is the fastest growing exchange serving over 190 countries globally with the easiest onboarding and lowest fees around. They're on a mission to make learning about and buying Bitcoin easier than ever, and they're all about bringing more financial financial literacy to everyone, which is something I really care about as well. From being the only exchange to integrate Lightning to contributing over a million dollars to Bitcoin core devs, they are doing incredible work to further the Bitcoin ecosystem. You can head to go.okcoin.com slash Natalie for $50 in Bitcoin when you sign up. Super excited to share a very special guest today, Patrick Bet David. Patrick is an entrepreneur, investor, content creator, and author. He's the CEO of Valuetainment, which has more than 10 million followers, and he's interviewed some big Bitcoin folks, including Anthony Pompliano, about why they believe Bitcoin is the future. You know, with Patrick's influence and success, I really wanted to hear his whole backstory and his take on Bitcoin and our current financial system. So here's Patrick. Patrick, thank you so much for, for joining me today. I'm super excited to chat with you about your life, your career, and Bitcoin. It's great to be on with you. So let's start at the beginning. I read that you were born in Tehran, in Iran, and I want to hear a little bit about also your parents, because I heard you say on a podcast your dad was an imperialist, your mom was a communist, and so they had this, these different ideologies at home, and I want, to, I want to learn more about that. So tell me about your young life. So listen, you know, uh, most people will say the greatest debate they watched was maybe uh, a, a Clinton against Bush senior, where Clinton capitalized off that opportunity or an Obama against Hillary when they're sitting down or, you know, maybe a Trump Hillary that one scene when he says, you know, because you'd be in jail and we think oh, these are such great scenes of debates, right? You see, our, our debates at our house were three dimensional. They had plates flying. It had, you know, a lot of different things happening when they were fighting. Uh, one believed rich people were uh, extremely greedy. That was my mom's side because they were communists. And my dad, the imperialists felt uh, poor people were lazy. And I'm in the middle here, fully confused. I never forget what that was like living in Iran at a time where, uh, you know, the regime, Iran was so successful in the 70s. Everybody wanted to go to Iran. Frank Sinatra would go perform in Iran. Matter of fact, the ambassador of uh, Iran to U.S., uh, Zahedi, who's still alive in his 90s, I think he lives in Switzerland, he used to date Elizabeth Taylor. So Elizabeth Taylor would go to Iran to visit Zahedi. They were together. They were an item. Go figure. Would you have ever imagined, it's like saying Kim Kardashian dates an ambassador from Iran. That happened in today, right? So that's what was happening back in the days. Wow. And then eventually it got to a point where uh, we wanted to leave. Uh, lived there 10 years, two years at refugee camp in Germany, and then we came here in 1990 to the States. Well, what did your parents do in Iran, and, and why did you need to flee? It's funny. My mom was the only one in our family that ever got a four-year degree. So she was very educated, but she didn't work. She was a stay-at-home uh, mom, and my dad would make makeup. So he made makeup for Nivea or Max Factor. Till today, just a year ago, he retired. He was making makeup for Stilla. He was making makeup for Mac, for uh, Estee Lauder. He knows how to, he would look at your face and he would come back and say, I got gifts for you next time I see you, Natalie. And he would come with a box of stuff. Use this color, use that color. I mean, all the stuff he talks about. All our girlfriends love my dad because my dad is a makeup master and the guy's 79 years old. So that's what they did for a living. My dad in Iran was doing okay. We lived in a, a two bedroom apartment complex in Iran. Uh, and uh, we had an okay life, never wealthy, never rich, but that was kind of our life in Iran. 
Did you grow up thinking that you wanted to be rich someday? Did you, I mean, you moved when you were 10 years old, right? So did you know that you were leaving a country that was essentially potentially dangerous and you needed to flee to somewhere safer? Uh, you, you know, there was not a lot of dreaming in Iran. I can't think of, and I'm a dreamer myself, probably the only dream we had in Iran was to one day come to U.S. Because uh, I remember the first time I watched Rocky IV, and then Rocky IV, the whole story is about, you know, Rocky going against Drago and the scene where if he can change, you can change. If I can change, we can change, right? He was trying to bring essentially Russia and U.S. together which today's Russia is China, but back then it was all Russia against U.S. And to me, it was kind of like, man, one day if we go to America, how great is that going to be? I can't wait to go to America. That was the only dream I had because, you know, once Khomeini took over in February of 79 till 89, it was constant war. Half a million people died. I remember one day we lived in Tehran, the capital. We got bombed 160 something times in a day is what we got in a day. So that whistling sound till today is here. So if I were to tell you the only dream, the only dream was, can we one day make it to America? So the reason why we left is uh, in Iran, when you turn 12 years old, you have to serve the military. In Iran, my mom didn't want that. I was 10 years old. And my mom told my dad, we got to leave and we escaped. And uh, uh, we escaped saying we're going on vacation and we just never came back. And then we got our visa and green card and came to wow. the States. Well, so what do you remember from your time in the refugee camp and then actually coming here? Did you guys go straight to Los Angeles? Yeah, so we went to New York and then we went to Glendale, California, but uh, Granada Hills, California, and then I lived in Glendale, California. But what I remember from the refugee camp, I will tell you what I remember about refugee camp. So one, uh, there was a, a Czechoslovakian family there who escaped Czech at that time because they escaped communism and socialism. Uh, we had a big community of Yugoslavia. Nowadays, you can't even say Yugoslavia because it's all broken apart. The family and I still keep in contact together, both the Czech the, it was my first girlfriend I had when I was 10 years old, 11 years old, Katarina Staff. We didn't find each other for 19 years. 19 years later, she followed up with me on Facebook because we promised we'd never marry anybody else. Because <laughs> we, we, very funny story on the last day before we were leaving, we decided to get together at five o'clock in the morning. We hugged each other and they couldn't separate us because I didn't want to leave. Anyways, 19 years later, she messaged me three weeks after I proposed to my wife. And she said, I finally found you. Very random story. With that one. So Czech, uh, Polish, uh, Pakistani, Afghanistan, Yugoslavia. Uh, you know, I, I'm still in contact with them, Miodrag and Ana Maria. They're living in uh, Canada now. But here's what, what the main premise was everybody was escaping an environment that didn't provide freedom. For some, it was religious. For some, it was business. For some, it was having an opinion. For some, it was whether you had money and they didn't like the fact that you had money. But no matter where you were, the main, you know, messaging of escaping was freedom, being left alone. Leave me alone for me to have my own identity. And everybody at this camp that we were living there, my sister sent me a video the other day. She says, look what I found. I found the street we were living on and the whole place. There was a military camp to our right. There was a U.S. Army camp. And me, Jan, and Katarina would go there on a hill and we would watch them with tanks blow stuff up. It was a training camp that they had. And, uh, you know, we would have apple juice and food that we'd leave at the end of the refugee camp and we'd go pick it up and bring it up and uh, uh, apple juice and cartons. And I went to school in Erlangen. There was a swimming pool there. Anyways, that's, that's the memories of refugee camp. I learned how important freedom is to everybody from 10 to 12 years old. Wow. So when you guys moved here, what did your parents do? Was it easy to assimilate and find work or what happened? So my dad filed divorce uh, of my mom when we were in Germany. She got served in uh, Germany wow. while at the refugee camp. He filed it from U.S. Pretty ugly situation between the two of them. They got married and divorced twice what? Uh, in 20 years. They got married and then my sister was born. Two years later, they got a divorce and then they remarried and then I was born. 14 years later, they got another divorce and they're not getting remarried again. By the way. <laughs> oh my gosh. So yeah, when we came, my mother was, uh, 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 you know, somebody that was relying on the government to support, uh, following the belief system of communism, which the government should take care of us. And then my dad worked at a 99 cent store in Inglewood. And my dad had 13 heart attacks from 1993 till I want to say, I don't know, 2002, 2002, he had 13 heart attacks. 
Fifty percent of his heart was black, dead. My goodness. Uh, three angiograms, three uh, angioplastics, uh, two or three stents in his heart. Uh, yeah, I mean, the guy said uh, he smoked two packs a day, drank every day. So that's what they did when we came here. That's why right after uh, he was working at a 99 cent store and I was living with my mom, I just said, I got to get out of here and I joined the army. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, well, I remember you talking on a podcast also just about, you know, being in high school, it was such a different time before social media and kids were more social and they would talk and they would, you know, imagine different scenarios. And I remember you saying you you guys loved, you were in a group and you, you would ask each other, like, who would want to be the billionaire? Who would want to be the famous singer? Who would want to be the president? Um, why did that mean so much to you? And, and sort of how were you shaped when you were young facing some of the struggle that you did with your family coming here? So when I came to America, that's when I started dreaming. That was the idea. Like, hey, why not us? Why not me? I don't know if it's going to happen to us, but what if? You know, hey, do you want to be Michael Jackson? Would you rather be Michael Jackson, Michael Jordan? Would you rather be the president or would you rather be the richest man, Bill Gates? And, you know, we would sit there and talk about it. But, uh, you know, I was known as the kid that I would, when we would walk back from Wilson Junior High School and we'd go under the freeway on Verdugo, there was a 20 minute walk, 30 minute walk. And I'd have 10, 20 people walking because I'd be telling stories. And the stories would be, imagine if one day, I mean, the stories varied. One day the story had to do with the hottest school teacher. Another day the story had to do with World War Party. Another day the story had to do, you're in the big leagues. Another day the story had to do with your performing in front of 50,000 people and, you know, the details. But we were such dreamers. The group, we all dreamt about it. What if one day dot, 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 right? And, uh, you know, like when uh, when uh, Biggie says it was all a dream, I used to read Word Up magazine, Salt and Pepper. And, you know, that that whole idea was us. It was all a dream to us. It was all what if one day. And uh, I got to tell you, the power of dream. And last time my uh, son, uh, uh, you know, he's got a great voice, eight years old. He's very charming, very attractive, muscular, in shape, physical, all the teachers that he's ever had. They all love him because he knows how to charm them into getting anything. But he's he thinks he has stage fright. So last night he's like, I said, so I'm going to put you with a, a singing coach because I want you to learn uh, uh, how to sing. Because I don't want to do that. Why? Because daddy has stage fright. And uh, both of them are laying there in bed. It's like 930. So what do you mean stage? What is stage fright? And they said, well, daddy, it's, it's, it's when you're on stage and you get scared. You don't know about it because you don't have it. I said, no, I don't know about it because I don't believe in it. I said, it's fake. It's a lie. Who told you this? There is such a thing. Who told you there is such a thing? Tell me. What friend? There isn't such a thing. It doesn't exist. It's fake. There is no such thing as stage fright. You don't need to worry about stage fright. So we're listening to this one song last night because he likes singing it. Uh, and uh, it's it's called Hallelujah by Pena, Pena, I don't even know how to pronounce the group's name. Um, uh, uh, Penta, Pentatonix? Oh, yeah, yeah. Pentatonix. So he's singing and I'm listening to this. I said, how much you like this song? He says, a lot. I said, do you know how many views this song has? He says, how many? I said, it's got uh, 640 million views. Wow. I said, how many thumbs up you think it's got? I don't know. Give me a number. He gives me a number. I said, it's got 6 million thumbs up. He says, wow. I said, how many thumbs down you think it's got? He said, I don't know, 74? I said, 176,000. I said, even as good of a song that this is, 176,000 people don't like this song. So I said, here's what I want you to do tonight. He says, what's that? I said, I want you to go to sleep tonight. Next year, when we host our convention in Vegas at MGM Grand, and we're going to have 15,000 people there, I want you to dream that you're going to sing in front of everybody a song. Close your eyes and dream to that. And I look at his oldest son. He can't sing, but he can talk. I said, I want you to be dreaming about giving the best speech you've ever given next year at 10 years old. You'll be 10. You'll be eight. You're going to sing. You're going to perform. Close your eyes. Dream about it all night. That's what I want you to do. And then I go downstairs. My dad is downstairs. It's me, my dad, Mario, Jen. We start talking about dreaming. And, you know, you know, my dad, you know, hey, what was the conversation like? I said, you know, it's crazy. I said, most of us eventually stop dreaming because we don't believe this is possible, right? I said, do you know what allowed me to go through all these difficult times in family, personal life, whatever it was? What's that? I lived in a la-la land. Like I lived in maybe. Even if it's this much of a chance of this thing becoming a reality, it's worth freaking fighting through it, right? So, yeah, to me, during that time, it was all about the possibility of one day dreams becoming a reality. And that was the fuel tank for all of us.
Did you always have this personality where you were a really big go-getter and just sort of assertive and confident? Because that's the vibe I get from you, but did you always have that? No, in high school, I never had a girlfriend. I have one girlfriend in senior year, think about it. I was, if I saw a girl pretty like you, I'd walk the other yeah. way. I couldn't do that in high school. You're like, oh, she's too hot for me. So I, I, uh, I, I, I wasn't secure because my environment wasn't an environment where it was injecting belief. I still had to figure out whether I had the goodies to win. I didn't know if I had the goodies to win or not. My grades in high school were 1.8 GPA. If wow. you right now were in my office standing right next to me, I don't know how tall you are, but I'm 6'4 and a half, 254 pounds, and I'm about 15% body fat. So I'm a pretty big guy and I train. I've been in good shape till about four, since about 14, 15 years old. I've never played organized sports ever. I've never played high school baseball, not high school football, not high school volleyball, nothing, even though you would have seen me towering over everybody else in high school because I was a pretty big guy. I always had a job afterwards. So for me, when I went into the military, probably the best thing I did is I, I was independent and I was around a lot of different people. And you had to learn how to deal with different personalities from different places. And at 18 years old, it's when I saw a girl like you, we're probably going to exchange numbers and go out. That changed in, high, in, in military where confidence came because I was like, no, we can deliver and everybody else is equal. And you, ain't, you, you don't need to be intimidated by anybody else because we can go do something big together. Probably the high level of confidence, I'd say, came 12 months after being in the Army at 18 or 19 years old. Hmm. That's interesting. I actually tweeted today that I, I'm a true believer that confidence comes from overcoming struggle. Like you have to go through the hard stuff because it just it builds the bricks and it's a solid foundation after that. And I noticed it about a lot of immigrants because my family came from Poland. I never had anything easily. And I saw all the kids around me having nice houses and all that. And I was like, oh, I have to work 10 times harder because I don't have, I don't have help. My family has no connections. They barely know the language. And I always had like a chip on my shoulder, but it helped. It drove me further. And I noticed that about very successful, high functioning people, which I, which I love to see. So I see that. I recognize that in you as well. But, um, why did you want to go into the military? I mean, why not, why not go to college, uh, you know, university and, and pursue something that's going to make you money? Yeah. So the only subject I paid attention to in school was math. Uh, I was the curve in my calculus class and pre-calculus class or math analysis because everything to me is math. Like right now I'm looking at you. I'm counting the stuff up here, the screen. Everything to me is math. Uh, my eyes look out from the lens of a mathematician. So I like math. Everything else was too boring for me. I had no desire to pay attention to it. And so after high school, I was working at Burger King at the time. And uh, I was going to Glendale Community College. I had four W's because I never went to class. The teacher opened it up and said, how many of you guys just came here from high school? We raised our hands. He said, well, guess what? What? You don't have to come to class because it's no longer high school. No one cares if you come to class or not. We just get care that you get the grades. I'm like, that's all you have to say to me. I'm not going to come to class. So I stopped going to class. But why? I mean, weren't you, weren't you motivated? No, not at all. I had no reason to live at that time. There was nothing... It was nothing that was motivating me. The li life was not an exciting life. It was a lot of annoying. I, I don't even like to talk about this stuff because I don't like people feeling bad for the, the time. It was a very rough part of my life. And I just wanted to get away. And so one day we got into a very big fight in Glendale High School campus. Terrible fight. Massive. A bunch of people involved. And I came back and, you know, we had a party at the house at my sister's place because I was living there for a couple of weeks. And one night we partied in the jacuzzi downstairs till God knows what time, you know, and drinking, hammered. I wake up in the morning. I go outside to get on my uh, 1983 Corolla that my mom left me because I sold my trucks. I didn't have any money to uh, go to Burger King and the car is not there. I'm like, what do you mean it's not here? Maybe I parked. Maybe I forgot. I was so drunk. I forgot where I parked. So I walked all over the place. I'm like, no, I didn't park it anyway. I called the cops. Anyways, they found it two weeks later in Tijuana, where my car was. In that moment, I can't go to Burger King. I can't go to school. I said, you know what? Screw this. I got to make a decision. I called my dad. I said, come pick me up. Take me to the recruiting station. I'm joining the Army. Came. I went to the uh, recruiting station. I told Jesus Guerra. I said, if you can get me to go to the Army tomorrow, I'll sign up right now. But I'm not waiting six months. I said, There's no way I can do it tomorrow. I said, then I'm not signing up. After three hours of making calls, I was in the Army two weeks later. I went to Fort, Fort uh, Jackson, South Carolina, and uh, 
stayed there for two and a half years. They had a delayed entry program. And uh, things changed very, very quickly when I got out of the Army. Well, so talk to me about that. What takeaways do you have? I mean, obviously, I, I feel like I, I read something where you liked the structure of the Army, and that brought you to another level of discipline, which ultimately helped your business career. So what were the next steps? You know, accountability, predictability, uh, uh, structure, expectation, high standards, uh, camaraderie, unified, teamwork, working together, stepping up, rising up challenging each other, uh, not afraid of having a tough conversations with your peers, backing each other up, having the fights behind closed doors to hash things out without having it be anybody else's business, taking responsibility without bitching and complaining about it. These are all stuff that you're going to learn in the military. If anybody ever gets out of the military and they say the military sucks, it's because they don't like those things. I got a lot of friends that joined the army. And when they got out, all they said is how terrible the military was. It's not that you hated the military. You hated what we had to do in the military. And quite frankly, it sucks. It's not that exciting. But at the same time, we part. I probably, if you ask me today, what are the hardest partying years of my life? I don't even think it comes close. I think from 19 to 21, 19 to 21, it was in the military. We worked 80, 90 hours a week, but we were partying Friday Saturday, Sunday night, coming in with four hours of sleep. So we had such a great time together as a core group unit army, but we also got the job done and we worked very hard. So you learn the balance of hard work and, you know, uh, also having fun. And, you know, just like anywhere you go, if you go to a networking event within one hour, you're probably going to talk to people that are like you, right? If you go to school and we're in a classroom and there's 30 people sitting there, Within probably two weeks, you're going to sit next to somebody else that you have something in common, values, principles, goals. The same thing was the case in the military. You eventually found people like yourself that you got along with. And I got to tell you, I'm probably still in touch with 10, 20 of the guys from the Army till today. Obviously, everybody's married with kids. They're all in their 40s. You know, it's a completely different life. But those are some of the things I liked about the military. So how did you start your career then? What, did, what were your first gigs? When I got out of the military, I was a bodybuilder. So I wanted to go win Mr. Olympia. So for me, it was all about going into fitness. So I started working at Bally Total Fitness. It was a gym back in the days. I think LA Fitness and 24-hour bought a bunch of them out. And I was a sales guy. I was selling gym memberships. Um, I did that for, for a while. And then one day I go to Mr. Olympia and to get closer to these Mr. Olympia guys to see, hey, what do I need to do to win Mr. Olympia one day? And I go hang out with these guys and they told me what I had to do with my body. And they told me how it was going to be for a guy my height, like what I needed to weigh, like off season at my height, I was going to weigh 350 to 400 pounds. Well, that's not good for your heart. You don't want to be that height because I want to live a lot longer than just 40, 45 years. So one Mr. Olympia, I go there and on the drive back, I said, I have no desire to win Mr. Olympia. I made my decision right there. And on the drive back, I get a call from Dave Kirby, who was the manager from Morgan Stanley Dean Widow, who called me and says, Patrick, but Dave, even though you don't have a four-year degree or a two-year degree, we're offering the position to two people. One is you. The other one is Solmaz Rashidi. You can start with us on Monday. You're officially a uh, advisor with Morgan Stanley Dean Widow, 21, 22 years old. Well, how did he know about you? How did that happen? I applied 100 different places. He was one of them that I applied. I got three job interviews, three job offers. Wow. He was one of the ones that gave me the offer. Uh, Morgan Stanley Dean Widow Glendale and my girlfriend at the time, uh, Jean Vier, used to work at Morgan Stanley Dean Widow Show. She told me you may want to work at Morgan and the rest is history. So my first day at Morgan Stanley Dean Widow was a day before 9 11. Oh, Monday. Wow. Yeah. Oh, man. Well, so what was that experience like? Because that, I mean, that must have given you a crash course in something you didn't really study, right? So you're learning on the go. What did that teach you? And how did you end up starting your own business? So remember, I like numbers, right? So so being an advisor, you know, series 7, 66, 31, 26, life and health, it's all numbers. Everything's about numbers. And I love numbers. So anything that I can be around numbers, I liked. Uh, the, the challenge was, how to sell to a market that's affluent, you know, you're because you're coming from a low income to middle income market. And Morgan's minimum at the time was a quarter million dollars. Today, it's a million dollars. So how do you go ask people to invest a quarter million dollars with you? How do you talk to that community? I remember one time I was at uh, 
a, 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 a hotel in San Francisco, Mark Hopkins Hotel at San Francisco with a classmate of mine whose name was Glenn Hopkins, whose wife, ex-wife, they had twins with. Do you remember the movie American Pie? Yeah. Where Stifler's mom was, uh, you, you know, you know the Stifler's mom situation that would hook up with the other guy. That was his ex-wife. Okay, so Stifler's mom was my friend's real ex-wife with twins. Anyways, really? so this guy, yeah, this guy. If you look him up, you'll see him and his wife. So if you look, if, if Glenn Hopkins was working at Marvel. I think he was working with Batman or something. He was this forty-three-year-old, good-looking guy, white guy, great physique, well-spoken. So we're in the same class together and I'm 21, 22, he's 43. So we go in the streets of San Francisco. He says, let's play a game together, young PBD. I said, yes. He says, let's sit at this cafe. We sat at the cafe. He said, we're going to play a game. Everybody that walks through that door, I want you to tell me what their net worth is. As you want me to guess their net worth? I want you to tell me what their net worth is. Okay. So a guy walks in, um, flip-flops regular white shirt and shorts and, you know, some kind of watch. And I said, I don't know. That guy looks broke. He's probably got $200,000. said, I guess probably worth $10 million minimum, if not higher. I said, $10 million minimum. He said, the watch he's got on is $200,000. Those sandals are 1200 bucks. Those shorts are $2,000. The shirt he's got on is $1,100. That's probably, the glasses are $800 glasses. Let me go talk to him. Let's find out. So he'd get up and he'd go walk to this guy. Oh Glenn God. Hopkins, if you're watching this, you train me how to prospect rich people, Glenn, if you ever see this. That's hilarious. So, so I would, he would go up and he would say, so tell me, nice shorts. I noticed you're wearing such and such watch. I'm watching this. I'm like, wow, this guy's good. And he'd walk back. He says, look at the business card, CEO of XYZ company. That's at least a $10 million guy. So we'd stay there two hours to play this game. Next person would show up. What do you think that guy's worth? I'm like, oh, that, guy's, that guy's a multimillionaire. He said, tell me why. Look at the suit he's got on. Look at the shoes. Wow. Look at the watch. This guy looks sharp. He says, that guy is so broke, you don't even know. He's not even worth a million bucks. That suit is a $100 suit. Look at the, you know, <laughs> hair in the back. He said, those shoes are discount shoes from DSW. You see that watch? That's a Folex, not a Rolex. So he says, let me prove to you. He'd get up and go talk to the guy. This is amazing. And he would say, see, he's a car salesman at a local Toyota. He just got started with them. So he was so good. at. So Morgan, to me, was very good at learning how to uh, 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 identify people with money, how to look at them, know how what kind of market you wanted to get into. Because a lower market, you'd have to do 100 times the work of a good market that you get into. So how do you steer yourself into a great market of clientele that give good referrals? And how do you win them over for them to send you more referrals? But that was the experience with Goldman, with Morgan. And then after Morgan, I went to Trans for about seven and a half years. And in October of 2009, started my own insurance company uh, with 66 agents. And today, we've licensed 30,000, but today we have actively shy of 20,000 agents, probably 150 offices nationwide. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, we had a convention last year with 10,000 plus people at MGM Grand Arena with Tyson. Mario Lopez was our MC. Sebastian Maniscalco was a comedian. Uh, uh, Nikki Jam performed. We've had Kevin Hart there. We had the late Kobe Bryant. We've had President Bush at our convention. So we've been able to grow that. But it all started off with Morgan Stanley Dean Witter at 21, 22 years old. Amazing. Okay, I want to ask you about that company, but it's so interesting what you said about the the clothes and kind of guessing people's net worth because growing up, I, my family didn't have a lot, but it was like a very European thing, right? You have to dress nice. You got to look like a million bucks. Even if you don't have that, you want to present yourself re really, really well. And presentation was very, very important. And then I remember going to school at Pepperdine, which is in Malibu, right? Everybody's got money. I'm, you know, going to going to class with students who are, their parents are bajillionaires. And you go to the country mart in Malibu and I'll never forget. I'm like, all these rich people dress like they're homeless. They're like in white t-shirts white t-shirt probably costs you know six hundred dollars or something and you know ugg boots and i'm like why do these people look like they're homeless they have so much money you know and it's kind of funny. <laughs> okay so how did you move into insurance how did you go from finance to insurance yeah great question so one day uh, uh we had a guy named shack who was an advisor asian guy named shack he looked nothing like shack he was a five three guy but a shack that was working at Morgan Stanley Dean with her. We had another girl there. I don't remember her name. She would sell annuities. Shaq focused on 401ks. We had another guy named Ed Malikdom that focused on money under management. Another guy that was a 
you know, uh, defined benefit plans or whatever he was doing. And then 9-11 happens. Day one is 9-10, day two is 9-11. When 9-11 happens, one of the guys in a corner who was making 700 grand a year within six months, his income went to $80,000. That was a big difference from 700,000 to uh, barely making six figures. And I went and talked to him and I remember the, the day after 9-11, when we all came back, the phones were all red because everybody was calling and people were afraid to take the calls and I'll never forget Dave Kirby and the other lady that was working there telling guys, pick up the damn phone. Tell them I'm not there. Tell them I'm not there. Tell them I'm not there. Pick up the phone. People were afraid to pick up the phone. So I said, okay, what do you do? What do you do? What do you do? The people that got the fewest calls were more targeting insurance or things that were a little bit more conservative, not that fluctuating, not that risky. And it was a very easier relationship with the client. You never called for bad news. The only bad news was, if they need to activate the insurance policy, which you know you don't want to get that call, but you get those calls. So I sat there and I said, do I really want to have managing, I don't mind my own money being in the stock market because I can have my own risk tolerance that I'm okay with, but do I really want to get a hundred calls every day of people when the market goes down, right. they call you. Then when the market goes up, they call you 10 times more. I don't know if I want to be a stockbroker. I'm good with this. So I made the adjustment. I looked at real estate, insurance, 401k, stocks, I said, I'm going to insurance and this is what I'm going to be doing. Wow, that's interesting. Just out of curiosity, do you remember sort of making your first million and just become getting to a point where you're like, I'm now financially secure. I'm I've made it. I don't have to worry anymore because, you know, there's like a sense of worry when you're not financially secure that just trumps everything because it's like you, you're burning the oil constantly. So when was that and what did that feel like? It's crazy you say that I, I probably, you know, I was a big saver when I figured out the saving part. And I would measure, I had an Excel spreadsheet that would track my credit score every month on the 18th. I would update my credit score because it used to be 484, 495, 499. I got it till today, that Excel spreadsheet. And I would track how much I had in a checking account, saving account, American funds, Transamerica, my WRL account, my collectibles, my card collection. I would just keep adding to it, right? So I remember the first, the first life-changing one was in May of 2000. Three, May of 2004, May 29th, I come in and I uh, check my uh, direct deposit. I got a $10,000 check that day. That month, I made $18,495. This is May of 2004. I made $18,495. That's the last month my mom or my dad ever reached in their pockets, ever. They never paid anything since that day, right? So that stays with me because my sister came and picked me up with her husband, uh, uh, and we went to Vegas to have a good time for the weekend. It was May of 04. I can tell you exactly where I was at. I can give you details, who checked my direct deposit, wow. what that feeling was like. Then from there, saving 50K, every time I uh, tied a goal and an experience to a savings goal. So, you know, I told myself if I get to, you know, $100,000 in savings, I'm going to go to, you know, New York and watch the ball being dropped. I'm going to stay at Manhattan because I want to see that ball being dropped. I remember the first time I saved a quarter million. I bought a Harley Davidson brand spanking new night rod special, and I had no idea how to write a night rod special when it came in. Everything was tied to a saving goal. I hit a saving goal. This guy got a selfish goal. I had a saving goal. So I remember 50,000. I remember 100,000. I remember quarter million. I remember half a million. I remember a million. I remember 10 million. I remember 100 million. I remember all of those numbers, what the feeling was like. Wow. But as crazy as it sounds, the most memorable one is 18,495. Amazing. I love that story. That's super cool. Okay, wait. So at what point did you start to put your your thoughts out there, your experiences out there to build the value attainment? I mean, when did that start? And then we'll kind of segue because I want to hear about your your Bitcoin or crypto thoughts. Because <laughs> that's your world. That's that's your world. That is your expertise. <laughs> Uh, so value attainment. So, you know, I was creating content for my own company, the agency, but it was all private. It was not public. So it'd be unlisted and I would only share it internally with the guys. One day, Mario says, Pat, why don't we create content uh, public? I said, let's do it. We started doing an episode every week called Two Minutes with Pat. They're still online, by the week. If you want to really laugh a little bit, go back and watch our first episode. It's called Two Minutes with Pat. We did 100 two minutes with Pat. I said, I'm going to do one video a week every week for two years. And then if it does, okay, there's an audience, we'll continue. If not, I don't want to create content. So we went two years, 100 videos. And the only video that was ever two minutes was the last video. Everything <laughs> was 11 minutes, eight minutes, nine minutes, six minutes. We're like, listen, we can't do this in two minutes. We're lying to our audience. The joke was, 
you don't do two minutes. You're like a 10 minutes with Pat, eight minutes with Pat. Then eventually we noticed there's an audience. Then we kind of stepped back. Then, you know, we did a collaboration with Entrepreneur Magazine. We became Entrepreneur Magazine's number one content creator for like two or three years. I was in their magazine on a monthly basis or every other month. So that, that collaboration was solid with them. And then we got to 100,000 subs. And then at 450,000 subs, I shut down the channel. I said, I'm done creating content. Why? At that point, I had two kids. I'm running multiple companies. I had no life. And I said, this is just not going to be sustainable. If we do it, it's got to be clear. So we took the channel. Uh, last video I did was shutting down by attainment. And we stepped away. And I said, listen, I'm not going to create content. I said, if we come back, it has to be something big, but I'm not coming back. Week went back. We didn't come back. Two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. Eventually, one day I'm sitting there feeling like a genius. And I said, you know, what do we do? The, the, the company, you know, uh, we provide value. We're entertaining people. And it's becoming a movement. What if we name it Valuetainment? Because everybody calls their channel by their name. I don't want to call it by our name. I want to build a media company. Let's call it Valuetainment. So I said, I guarantee no one's got this name. Well, we go to Valuetainment.com. We realize it's a publicly traded company on the stock market in Germany. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. So I reach out to the CEO, a guy named Dirk, and I send him a message. I say, hey, we'd love to buy your domain. And he says, uh, what do you mean buy your domain? It's a publicly traded company. I'm not selling you the domain. It's our company's name. I said, sell it to us. I want to buy it. He said, I'm not selling it to you. Anyways, he finally says, here's a million bucks. If you pay it, I'll sell it. Yes, I'm not paying you a million bucks. I said, but I promise you, I'm going to flood the internet with content around value attainment, and you're not going to like it because they're going to think you're me. So just be ready. He says, I'm not selling it to you. Anyways. Oh, my gosh. So we go and light it up with a nice guy, by the way. We go and light it up. Three years later, he changes his company to Value Tees and sells me the domain for 27 some thousand dollars and we bought the domain by attainment. So <laughs> then, then by attainment went to a million subs, two million subs, three million subs. Now we have attainment Russian. It's got nearly 300,000 subs. We have a short clip channel that's got a couple hundred thousand subs. Anyways, we're doing a bunch of different, we got a podcast with 100,000 subs. So media, what, what's the ultimate uh, vision with what we're doing today uh, with media. I believe in having four 20-year runs. The first 20-year run of your life, just make sure you don't make big mistakes. Make mistakes, but not the big ones. Don't get a felony. Try not to get anybody pregnant in the first 20 years. Like Hang out a little bit. Have your fun, but do whatever you can to be sponsored by Trojan condoms. Just don't make the bigger mistakes the first 20 years of your life. And I know this sounds funny, but that's like the main things you don't want to do first 20 years. Yeah. Second 20 years, if you're lucky and you can find one industry to go on a 20-year run with, not a 10-year run, not a five-year run, not three years. Everybody wants to go on a one-year or a three-year run. All the big guys are 20-year runners. I don't want to go on a five- or a 10-year run. I want to go 20 years. So I said, 20 years, insurance, this is what I'm doing. My 20 years is officially up two months ago, by the way, just so you know. It's been 20 years, two months ago. So I said, I'm going to go 20 years. Okay. The next 20 is going to be creative. So first 20, make your money. Second 20, creative. Last 20 is contribution. This is how I process it. I love that. So next 20 is creative. For me, creative-wise, I always wanted to tell stories. I always wanted to make movies. I always loved turning people into stars. I always like building people up, like king builder type of stuff. I like seeing a person that wants, got talent. Let's go make sure the world knows about what this person's talent is. And then I'm not seeing what's going on. I'm not liking what's going on with America today, where a lot of people are actually questioning capitalism, like Elon Musk is enemy of the state number one for what? Because he's got a net worth of $300 billion, created $2 trillion of wealth, which means another $1.7 trillion of wealth has been created by other people for other people. And this guy's worked 80 hours a week for 20 something years, seven days a week. And you want to bitch and complain about the fact that he's got to pay more taxes. And quite frankly, 1% of America right now pays 40% of all the American taxes. Yep. And top 10% pay 70% of taxes, taxes. And we want to demonize a small business owner that had a shitty life the last 18 months where they had to keep paying money to people that kept seen as the enemy because the small business owners employs 49% of American workers today in America. That, that restaurant that's got 22 employees that can't afford margins to increase you, increase minimum wage to 15 bucks an hour. The guy has to increase the hamburger from $8 to $12. Yeah, I want to protect that small business owner that's doing their part. I want to make sure that person, he or she, they sacrifice their 401k, their salary to go start a small business. I want to make sure the world knows how big of a hero they are. Look, there's patriots, which is veterans and military folks. Then there's patriots who risk their steady salary to go start a business. It's very hard. 
It's very difficult. Many times it leads to heart attacks, anxiety attacks, divorces, losing everything, going back. It's not an easy uh, situation to be. So a part of value team, and here's what we say when we hire people, we don't care where you stand politically. We don't care where you are with your sexual orientation. We don't care where you are with ethnicity. We don't care where you are with anything, but you got to believe in capitalism because that's the foundation thing about working at PH at Vitamin. We believe in capitalism. We believe that is the way to solve 90% of the world's problems. So anyways, that's kind of the whole thing from a YouTube channel to a media company that it is today. I love that. I love everything you said. I completely agree with it. I'm a huge believer in capitalism. It's one of the reasons why I'm very passionate about Bitcoin. And before I ask you about, about Bitcoin and when you heard about it first, just out of curiosity, why do you think we're headed in this direction in this country? I mean, we were founded on the principles of capitalism and self-determination and freedom. And here we are just basically people walking up to the government saying, handcuff me. I don't, I'm good with that. You know, I don't, I don't want to make the decisions for myself anymore. And it's like they're, they're allowing freedoms to to be eroded. Um, we're becoming more and more dependent financially on the government. It's it's just, I can't believe that in America we're headed in this direction. This is not the country that my parents envisioned when they wanted to come here. Yeah, I, I agree. We're on the same page there. And you know, here's what I would tell you. So my experience has been the following. You got four kids, okay? Typically out of your four kids, one of them is going to be extremely independent. You don't need to do anything for the guy or her. She'll do it all herself. Then another one's going to be needing a little bit of help, but he or she will get it done. Then one is going to need help, but there's going to be one out of four that's going to be a big complainer. Okay. That's going to be complaining about that's not fair. You know, the word kids use, that's not fair. That's not fair. That's not fair. The independent guy never complains. He just does his job. Mm -hmm. So America today, unfortunately, we are seeing the talent of complainers. They are louder than those who just get the jobs done. See, the people that get the job done, they typically don't need all the attention in the world. They just go get the job done. Just leave them alone. But the problem with the people that want to be left alone is if you don't voice your opinion and what you stand for, and complainers do, even though there is 100,000 of you and only 500 complainers, but the 500 complainers are screaming off the top of their lungs, and out of the 100,000 doers, only five of you are raising your voice about how hard you're working under power of being free, the 500 complainers will whoop your ass because you're so quiet. So, so many people that have worked hard and have had their dreams become a reality, they are almost afraid to talk about their dreams. Yesterday, I'm at this church that we just you know, got involved in, and I'm, I'm very selective about going to church and all this stuff because there's certain things about the church that uh, uh, rubs me the wrong way, even though I'm a Christian myself. I'm not, I was an atheist for 25 years. I'm a Christian. I raised my kids with strong uh, uh, conservative uh, fundamental values because that's what I think is the highest success ratio for my kids to live a good life. So anyways, we go to this church and at the end of the church, uh, the pastor has given a message about the fact that, you know, the whole thing with the camel, the needle, you know, rich people, you're not going to go to heaven. You're not going to take your stuff with you, which is absolutely right. You're not. So at the end of it, one of the guys that's a trader there who does pretty well for himself knows I bought a $1 million Ferrari. Okay. He knows I bought this Ferrari. And after the church and service, he comes up to me in a snobby way. And he says, so how's your Ferrari doing? He says to my face. Okay. So I look at him. I'm like, car's doing good. How's your family? Please give them my best. Right. And I walk away. So comments like that to others makes them feel like it's better to be quiet and not mm -hmm. tell the world about how hard you're working. Today, people like Bernie Sanders have scared the shit out of entrepreneurs that they're afraid to talk about the dream life that they're living today. Mm -hmm. The back in the days, it was like we, I, we admired the guy that went and created a job, the woman that started a business and now it became this. Today, it's like, look at these wealthy people. Look how bad they are. I think the entrepreneur and the capitalist need to figure out a way to deliver their message and the message isn't just tied to Ferraris and Lambos and Porsches or all that other stuff. The entrepreneur needs to tell the story to realize that top 1% of America pays 40% of all the taxes. The top 10% of America pays 70% of all the taxes. So every pretty much entitlement program, military, whatever you think about healthcare, all of that is paid by the top 10% of taxpayers. So no matter what rhetoric anybody gives you, that's what's going on with taxes. And entrepreneurs and capitalists need to also tell the, tell the story of 
how hard it is, how tough it is, why so few do it, the sacrifices, the anxiety attacks, the heart attacks, the panic attacks, the long nights, the dates you didn't go with your kids, the days you miss with your kids, all of that stuff to start a business. And now you got 180 people that got a job. Yeah, that guy's a hero. Sam Walton was a bad guy. Why don't you go try to get 2.3 million people jobs worldwide? You go ahead and do it. Oh, uh, Jeff Bezos is a bad guy. I don't really know what Jeff's politics are. But if you can get another person that can go create a company that's going to provide a half a million jobs, give us 10 more of those guys because taxes go down anytime an entrepreneur creates jobs. So yeah, I, got a, I got a problem where with the direction America is going today. And we we kind of want to voice our opinions a little bit. And by the way, I, I, I'm, I'm, uh, people are not too happy with some of the stuff I talk about, but we're going to stay um, pretty lit for quite some time. Yeah, but I think the people that aren't happy, they really just don't understand how economics work. And they blame capitalism on the problems that government is actually creating because they really don't understand how the system works. They don't know the Cantillon effect or how money printing actually functions. And so, um, you know, everything that you just said actually reminds me of a fascinating speech I heard about a week ago at a conference I went to for Bitcoin. There was a, a great speaker, his name's Alex Svetsky, he's a writer, and he talked about how um, society's divided into three groups the remnant, the masses, and the parasites, essentially. And I'm, I'm probably going to butcher this, but this is the takeaway I got. The remnant is, is a very small percentage that creates all the value. They're the entrepreneurs. They're driven by freedom and you know fulfillment and wanting to make a change and work really, really hard. Then there are the masses. That's the majority of people. Unfortunately, some of them are sheeple. They're just basically looking for where they should go. They want to be led. They're looking for direction from someone that can guide them. And then there are the parasites. And the parasites are failed remnants, and they're resentful of the remnants. And so what they do is they rile up the masses, and they go, they're the ones causing your problems. You're unhappy because they're the ones getting away with taking your money. They're, you know, they're taking advantage of you. Come with me. We'll get back at them. We'll get back at them. Come with me. I'll give you all the stuff. You don't have to work for it necessarily. I'll just give it to you. Right. And you can make a conclusion what you think the parasites are. But I found it to be so mind blowing and fascinating because especially I, I didn't think about this too much before the pandemic. But since the pandemic, I'm like, wow. This is incredible to me. There are some people who are still like, hey, you know what? We're going to opt out. We're going to go. We're going to work hard and continue on our path. And other people are just like looking for direction from any authority. And that moves us into communism eventually. I mean, I'm, I know we're not there. This is America. It's still better than 100 other countries. But but we're moving in that direction. I truly believe that. Yeah. What's Alex's last name, by the way? Alex? Svetsky. Okay, give it to me afterwards when we're done with the interview. I'd love to see what he has to say about that. Very okay. interesting. I agree with him. I agree with him. Yeah. Okay, so let me ask you this because I know you're probably short on time. Um, when did you hear about Bitcoin and what are your general thoughts on this whole space? Because I think this is actually an opportunity for people to build wealth and take back some of this power. Yeah, so Bitcoin, uh, the moment I started creating content is when I started hearing about Bitcoin. So go back to... Uh, 2012, 2013, you know, people are talking about Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, all this stuff. Like, okay, let's see what's going to happen with this. And, you know, it, it wasn't all positive. If you remember at the beginning stages of it, there was a lot of negative things to it. And uh, it, even experts who claimed they knew how it worked, they had no clue how it worked. There was only a few guys. I think the first person that really uh, cleared it up for me was when I, when I talked to Pomp. Anthony, to me, just broke it down. I had Craig Wright on. I had a bunch of guys on. Craig Wright is maybe one of the most hated guys in the area of Bitcoin. And then I brought Pomp on, which is probably one of the most loved guys and respected guys on the Bitcoin side. Just kind of wanted to get the story. But I heard about it, I want to say 2012, 2013, and followed it a little bit more closely, I'd say two or three years ago, a lot more closely in the last 12 months. And then obviously we know where Bitcoin's at today. So did you start investing? Like, do you hold Bitcoin? Do you believe in it? Do you think that it could solve some of the problems that our, our country is facing right now? Yeah. So at the beginning, no. In the last two years, yes. More in the last eight months than before. But I don't have a lot in Bitcoin. I probably have maybe a million dollars or something like that in Bitcoin. It's not like I have a tremendous amount of my percentage of my uh, net worth in it. Uh, here's, here's how I work. So I know a lot about baseball cards. I know a lot about baseball cards. I made a lot of money on baseball cards. Uh, I have probably, you know, give or take high $8 million, maybe low $6 million worth of collectible cards. 
that's what I have. I and I never lost money on cards. If I buy uh, older cards, you just don't lose them, especially if the athlete is no longer here with us. You know, if you buy younger athletes, there's a lot of risk to it. But I know cards. Uh, you know, when you look at Bitcoin and Ethereum, if you make the argument for Bitcoin, I mean, you can't debate Bitcoin nowadays. It is what it is. If you're going to be a believer of NFTs, you have to believe in Ethereum. You just can't fight that either because the NFTs are linked more with Ethereum. We saw what happened last week or two weeks ago with Zuck and talking about the meta world, the meta space, all this stuff. I remember when I interviewed Meta Coven. Meta Coven is a guy that bought people's uh, every days for, I think, $69 million, right? And I interviewed both of them the following week. And Meadow Coven was in Singapore at the time. I said, why would you buy Beeple's every day? He says, what do you mean? He says, are you kidding me? Of course I would buy it. I said, but tell me why you bought this. He says, look, one day you're going to come to my virtual museum. And to see every day at my virtual museum, you're going to have to buy a ticket. And I'm the only one that owns Beeple's every day. And you're going to have to come to my virtual museum. He says, and one day there's going to be virtual real estate, virtual waterfront properties, virtual this, virtual that. What is this guy talking about? He says, but that is the direction we're going. And they're absolutely right. I remember playing video games back in the days and it was virtual. There was a game. I don't remember what the name of the game was, but it was the first game, which was like a, you're living in a different world. And was so cool playing the game. Um, look, it, it, we were having a conversation where people were debating about this whole thing with meta and all this other stuff. I said, look, let me put it to you this way. I read a book one. I read a magazine one time by Time. Time magazine cover says, you know, how uh, millennials are narcissists. This was like six years ago, five years ago. And the guy's talking about all millennials want to do is take pictures of themselves. All they care about is how many likes. All they do is this, this, that. He says, but here's the reality of it. If you think millennials have no clue what the hell they're doing, maybe it's because you're just getting old and you are old, accept it. What that means is if you fight Bitcoin, NFT, Ethereum, crypto too much, Maybe you're a little old. If you fight uh, the meta world, maybe it just means you have a hard time with change because change is here and you ain't got a choice because the next generation, the 14, 18, 24 year olds, the 30 year olds are leading the world in that direction. And there's nothing you can do about it. They have so much control and experience over that, that you either have to adjust and learn how to adapt and pivot and make your business in a way that's going to work in that way, or you don't. So to answer your question for you, I don't think it's going away. I think it's here to stay. But the only enemy you will have, here's the enemy you will have. Uh, a guy like Jamie Dimon is not a fan, right? And $7 trillion of money gets transferred. You know, they touch $7 trillion a day. Chase does every single day. It's a lot of money to touch. Uh, Yellen is not a fan, Okay. Uh, uh, Biden's camp's not a fan. Elizabeth Warren, not a fan. Some of these guys are not fans because they're driven by regulation and control. And they have a history of doing this for many, many years. Right. The they only, benefit from the current system. Yeah. The only enemy you have is them. If, if it's left to innovation, it's, there's no stopping it. But if you have only one enemy, it's those guys that are going to be scared shitless of not having any control over it. Yeah, I mean, isn't that crazy to think about, though? Like, who's holding the dam back? It's like a few people and millions on the other side, potentially. Because at the end of the day, anyone can opt out at any point and go on to the Bitcoin standard if they wanted. And, you know, I, I there's still certainly financial literacy issues going on. People don't understand it, right? So, and it's not the easiest thing to understand. You have to go down the rabbit hole. But I do find it interesting that the amount of people that are actually holding holding it back it's very, it's, it's a small amount. Like we overpower them at the end of the day. It really is. But, but here's, here's one thing that's different about the Bitcoin community, the crypto community, the NFT community, then the gold community, then the real estate community, then the stock market community. I have to tell you the biggest factor with the crypto community, they're the loudest. They're so loud. Because gold community is quiet. Yes, Peter Schiff is loud. Let's just say he's loud. Who else is loud on gold? Nobody else. It's not that many people that are loud on gold. Real estate. Okay, fine. You got a lot of real estate people. Fiat. Who the hell is loud for fiat currency? Tell me who is loud for fiat currency. Not a lot of people. Okay, stocks, all that stuff. But when it comes down to crypto, they're, they're loud. They're attractive. They're young. They're innovative. They're energetic. They're united. 
their community. They're a voting community you don't want to lose. Like, I don't know if politicians, like, they're going to have to start considering these people. They're like, hey, hey, you know, we got to win the women's vote. So why don't you do a salad thing and eat salad? And let's post a picture on Instagram. Oh, my gosh, he eats salad and no ranch. Oh, I'm going to vote for him. You know, all this BS stuff that these campaign managers say. Oh, why don't you go drive a Tesla or a Prius and say that you're very responsible and you change your truck from a gas guzzler to now an electrical vehicle. Oh, wow, what a noble guy he is, right? We got to win the Democrat. We got to win the Latino vote. We got to win the Hispanic vote. We got to win the African-American vote. It's very soon going to be, we kind of got to win the crypto vote. So the the thicker you get, you have so much power, the thicker you guys, the community gets. It's going to be tough to go uh, against the crypto community because if they do, they're going to lose a big, big uh, community of voters. I don't think they want to do that. Yeah. Okay. So to start to wrap up, just thinking back on your life, you obviously now you're a father. I'm sure that you've thought about, you know, how you want your kids to experience life and grow up informed by the way that you grew up. So, you know, we were talking about the metaverse. Do you, do you ever have concerns about them growing up in a different way than you did with now digital identities and their, their world is basically not even real necessarily. People are not socializing as much. Like what are your thoughts looking back on your life and looking forward for your kids. Yeah, you know, Mike, you know, look, when when Elvis was shaking his hips, people were scared, right? Like, oh my God, everyone's gonna go have sex together, right? <laughs> when radio came out or when TV came out or when, you know, phones came out or when social media came out, it was always, what if, you know, what if this is gonna happen? This is not good to have too much access and all this other stuff. You know, I have a 1976 issue of a Playboy magazine sitting on my desk that I had my assistant buy And the reason why I bought it is because an article written by Jimmy Carter, right? An article written by Jimmy Carter that I'm reading. It's a fascinating article. Uh, But Playboy's changed. This used to be the magazine. Why would you subscribe to Playboy today, right? People were scared. Porn is online. Oh, my gosh. It's so much access. You know, people are watching porn. So this was a fear for a lot of people that what porn is going to do. And then you have robots. What if we marry a robot? What if one day robots take over the job? And that's been happening as well. There's not really much we can do about technology and innovation. You know, I think the biggest challenge for me and my kids is, is trying to understand the current uh, era. And if, and if we as parents cannot understand what it is to be them, you're going to lose them. I mean, it's even more pushback if you don't understand their world. So we got to be more involved. We got to be more collaborative. It's got to be more Tell me why you like playing this video game. What do you like about this part? Educate me. I want to learn a little bit more about why you like this. And then you try to steer versus you can't do this because I think if you do that, you're going to lose them even more. Things are moving very fast. Things are moving very quickly. Parents also have to uh, be involved probably more than ever today, more than ever before, because there's access for wrongdoings to also take place today. So if a parent's too lazy, it could happen to you. But if a parent's involved, you can minimize the chances of abuse also taking place. But there's nothing parents can do to slow down this process. It's here to stay. Mm -hmm. Well, this question is inspired by Squid Game. I don't know if you've seen it, but I just finished the series. So spoiler alert, everybody. But there's a really interesting part at the end where this guy is talking about people who have money because, you know, at the end of the game, you, you you win a huge prize. And he said that the very, very rich people and the very poor actually have a lot in common. And when you get to be very, very rich, things start to get boring. Like you can no, you you no longer really derive pleasure out of things because you could do anything you want. Um, is that true? And what are your thoughts on that? I I don't know because I think there's so many things to experience in life. If I think what gets boring. So I studied, my dad would always say, you're so lazy, you're so lazy, you're so lazy. He would always tell me this when I was a teenager. And when I'm like, what the hell is laziness stemmed from? Until I realized laziness is stemmed from boredom. Okay. And what do you mean by boredom? Well, if you go watch a boring movie, what happens to us naturally? We fall asleep. You ever fall asleep in a movie? It's boring. I remember when I watched Lincoln with Daniel Day-Lewis, great acting job, very slow the first 20 minutes. I was knocked out cold. I was gone, right? Very boring start to a movie. So I think those, if your goal was all along just money and you stop creating, yeah, you're going to be bored. But if the goal was never about money, it was to constantly create new things, just like in every family, a new child brings brings families together. My parents didn't see each other for 20 years. But the first time they were in the same room together was because my sister 
gave birth to our niece, Grace. Grace brought my mom and dad together. Anything new that you create unites. The less we create, the more it divides. So if the person's goal was about just becoming rich, yeah, you're going to be eventually be bored. But if your goal was to create newer experiences and better things, how the hell do you get bored? I don't know how you get bored. I love that. Awesome. Well, this has been such a pleasure. Um, the last question I have for you is just, what would you tell your younger self? Be uh, aggressively patient. Don't second guess yourself too much. Uh, if you know the vision is real, just go play ball. Uh, if you're going to do something with your life, Either go for all the marbles or be okay losing it all as well. Like, don't try to keep everything just perfect and safe. You don't have that much anyway. So just go play ball, go chase your big dreams like you did, and everything will eventually work out. The right people will show up eventually.